If you currently play Destiny 2 or have played Destiny 2 in the past, hell, even if you've never heard of or touched Destiny, this video is for you. I want you to close your eyes for a second. Now imagine a game that has the no question best pew pew in a first person shooter and it has some whoosh space magic to complement it. What if I told you not only could you shoot aliens with hundreds of different guns, bows, rockets, swords, and even laser beams, but you could also launch black holes at them. You could burn them to death. You could even move like a god in doing so. You'd be instantly sold, right? Now what if I told you that there was super hard secret missions for amazing weapons that change the way you play the game around them. Full campaigns fleshing out the story of the world. Seven raids, three of which are completely free to play. Three dungeons, one of which is free to play. 31 PvP maps. Six PvPVE maps in the mode Gambit. 17 strike activities, and way more. I think you'd be jumping out of your seat to play this game. Now enter the DCV or Destiny Content Vault, which is Bungie's version of Disney's vault for their IP, and a lot would change for this titan of a game. This was the iceberg that the company Bungie's Titanic would work their way towards, and it's fitting that ice would be the centerpiece of the topic of today's video, the DLC Beyond Light. Beyond Light was supposed to be, quote, the next trilogy of stories Bungie would try to tell with Destiny. It's easy to forget how much has changed with Destiny in one year. The topics we will go over for this video include the Rona, Sunsetting, Destiny 3 vs Destiny 2 Continuing, New Management, New Studio, Upgraded Engine, The Battle of Stasis, Sunsetting, the expectation and hype versus reality, the free to play experience, the story, those characters within the story, and so much more. So I guess there's a lot to talk about, and I encourage you to watch to the end of this video to form your own opinion about Destiny in the one year since Beyond Light, an expansion that I believe split the entire Destiny community's view of Destiny in half and one that I hope with the Witch Queen will have unison love and admiration again. So let's begin. Yo, chads and chadettes, this is Frag Pro Shooter, and I just want you to try it. But why download Frag? Well, it's free to play for starters. It's a shooter, and it has 100 million people playing it. For those who don't know Frag, there's over 100 unique characters where you build a team with five of them at a time, and face people online with them in a 1v1, even with an anti-cheat. Yes, Frag has an anti-cheat. If 1v1 doesn't suit your needs, Frag has different modes to unlock, like 2v2, Street Frag, and Payload. 2v2 you can even play with a friend. There are even free rewards just for you, only thanks to the link in the description or the QR code on your screen, even for those who have already installed Frag. For the first 100 of you guys who do download Frag, please DM me a screenshot on Twitter and I will enter you in for a chance to win the Witch Queen. It's free to download, so make sure you DM me a screenshot and I can enter you in. Thank you so much to Frag and I hope you download this game. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video as well as the music too. Also some footage, me! live on Twitch at EvanF1997, where I live stream almost every single day. Link to my stream in the description too. I'll be seeing you there. Final shameless plug is Gamersups. I won't stop talking about it until you try it. And hey, they even have free samples on their website. So give it a try and use code Evan, you absolute Chad or Chadette. All right, let's start at the beginning. The world shut down. The thing that we're not allowed to mention on YouTube infected a lot of people. And so the production of everything, including video games, slowed down too. Destiny also shifted to the homes. Anyone who says that Beyond Light wasn't an insane achievement to make anything, let alone a major DLC for a game as large as Destiny is fooling themselves. I'll anecdote this one from personal experience. 
I went to college for a degree in writing for television. That typically means being grouped up with a team, collaborating back and forth, exchanging ideas, learning that reading a line out loud gives off a way different meaning than how it sounded in your head. This is just the basics for one piece of one team, in a studio that has hundreds of people working toward the same goal. And you're telling me we have to do this at home? On Zoom? Fucking Google Hangouts with so much delay? That everyone is talking over each other the whole time and not paying attention because all they want to do is not work because they're not in a work environment? Point is, we have to hold that part of the story in high regard, as it has heavy influence on some parts with Beyond Light. But it also doesn't mean we can't be critical of the holes that Beyond Light created, starting with... So for those unfamiliar or those who need a refresher, sunsetting is a common method in MMOs to basically wipe the current gear for new gear the next reset, the next DLC, etc. It's a way to keep the game fresh for everyone. Players who have conquered the game tend to have a reason to start all of their builds over again, and players who don't play the game have a reason to jump in without getting stomped by returning players. Bungie applied this method of sunsetting to just about everything in Destiny. Weapons that players have been using for years, armor that took a long time to get just the right roll of, etc. Now the execution seemed decent on paper, but Bungie's version of sunsetting was more nuanced than I think anyone thought it was going to be. You see, in games like World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy and other MMOs, sunsetting works because the game isn't dependent on that key factor we discussed earlier, the feel of the pew pew. Destiny, I'd argue, is so dependent on that feeling that removing a player's weapon makes them feel like they're losing their in-game identity. I know some of my channel's videos touch on the legacy of weapons, and that's because they just feel that good to shoot. There's usually a story behind every weapon, and speaking of story, Bungie sunset that too, saying that, quote, Destiny 2 is too large to efficiently update and maintain. The size and complexity of the game are also contributing to more bugs and less innovation. So instead of building a Destiny 3 and leaving D2 behind, each year we are going to cycle older, less actively played content out of the live game and into what we're calling the Destiny Content Vault, the DCV. The aim of the DCV was sound. I mean, the game in the previous season, the Season of Arrivals, may have had a lot of content, but new bugs were popping up in every activity, and the game was getting run over by players killing the raid bosses with anything and everything. Bungie knocked out three full campaigns, one being a solid 10 hour play and the other two being about six combined. Bungie also removed 11 crucible maps for PvP players, bringing the number of maps down to 20. Seven strikes were removed, bringing the number down to 10. Gambit, or the PvPVE mode, lost two maps, bringing the number down to four. Raids? Destiny lost five raids, with all of the free-to-play raids gone too, bringing the number just down to two raids. These raids were very easy, and there will always be a part of me that wonders if Bungie just wasn't proud of them anymore. So vaulting may see them return one day with revamped encounters and refined loot. Now the justification in the game's narrative was that we were losing destinations to the alleged Big Daddy, the Pyramid Ships, the Darkness. With Io, Titan, Mercury, and Mars all being sucked up by them and in a vortex. So not destroyed, just not controlled. You can already feel the backlash coming. I mean, losing all the places, weapons, armor, secret missions, and just memories you made has to hurt. Good thing Destiny had a plan for sunsetting, right? Right? Well, with the Rona factor and the size of the game factor, it's hard to be that organized team. Producing new content is also a lot harder than removing old. You have to constantly get creative and not let the player feel like they're doing the same daunting task. And you have to hope that players don't just say, well, this is just that thing from this thing that was sunset. Unfortunately, this leads to a lot less content and a lot more missing pieces. 
I made a video talking about how Destiny desperately needed to change since the way sunsetting was implemented hurt everyone. Longtime players, new players, free to play, hell, even developers. In its at the time state, sunsetting gave no reason to buy Forsaken, no reason to play Beyond Light at release, no reason for any of it since the sunset timer on your loot was set to one year. So it made earning weapons completely irrelevant, knowing they'd be gone in a year's time. And that included the raid weapons too. I can remember thinking to myself, well, I might as well not touch the game until the summer since that would create a window to hold my weapon for the longest amount of time until the next raid. Beyond Light has also done a lot of good since its release, and it can feel like I'm just ragging on the expansion. Trust me, we'll get to the good soon. But this focal point of sunsetting did more damage than anything Bungie has done in Destiny 2 since Vanilla, creating a very anti-consumer precedent. A precedent where I find myself not being able to recommend Destiny 2 to new players anymore, because the trust in what you buy has been broken so hard by this. A longtime player or someone who just likes Destiny can always come back and enjoy it, but knowing that your stuff isn't safe doesn't read well to someone who wants to get started. Beyond Light dropped with one raid and one strike. No new Crucible maps, Gambit became a change mode with no new maps as well, and that was it. A light campaign, a strike, better lost sectors, an amazing, albeit easy, raid, and an odd season. We will talk about some more parts of that later in the video, but to end off the sunsetting chapter, everything seemed dark and terrifying until February. <laughs> February is where a lot changed, and we will reference this month a ton in this video. But for sunsetting, this is when the gears shifted the other direction. Sunsetting mostly got sunset. It was getting out of hand to the point where there was even a statement via Luke Smith that supers were going to be next. Bungie stated, and I'm paraphrasing, that they would not sunset any weapon or armor piece past Season 9, and this included mods and raid weapons. Additionally, they would add weapons we lost back in activities still remaining from the sunset groups, this time with new perks to keep them fresh. As the year went on, the sunset problem was seemingly fixed. Vendors had stock, even Zer got some loot to chase. And new management came in. We saw a whole new vision for Bungie, one that included a new studio, new director, new plans for Destiny, Destiny passed Lightfall and into the final shape, and even more of a universe afterward. There were only a few casualties, like Pinnacle Weapons, which we made a video on, but let's be real, those weapons were the root of sunsetting, and if you're unfamiliar with Destiny, I have a video on it. You guys should go watch it. As far as seasonal content went, players may not have gained a whole lot of new new, but just as vaulting content happened, so did unvaulting. As the year went on, Destiny added a raid and three strikes from Destiny 1. No new Gambit or Crucible though. Developers tend to work far ahead, and the vision that Bungie had with its original sunsetting was starting to become more apparent as time went on, and new metas were put in place. But within the new system, the new content is a whole lot better. Sure, players lost the identity of Destiny 2 and its iconic locations, probably doing more irreparable damage and splitting the community harder than anything Bungie has ever done. But Destiny also gained parts of what was supposed to be Destiny 3 and parts of Destiny 1 in the same game. Content vaulting may not be perfect ever, but within the limitations of game size since Destiny is a console-based shooter, this is the necessary sacrifice that Bungie has laid out. I'm not an expert. I'm not a game developer. I'm the worst armchair developer you've ever seen. I'm terrible at this, but I almost wonder how well a port of Destiny 2 with vaulted content to play and download separately would go over. Because for a long time, I doubt people will want to try Destiny again, knowing that what they pay for could be taken away from them. Bungie did remedy vaulting in the next wave of it, but it's not perfect in the Witch Queen. Losing the Year 2 Forsaken campaign and the Tangled Shore, which is the starting destination of that DLC. 
but not the Dreaming City and all the activities with it. Destiny 2 is also losing two strikes from that destination as well, instead of the confusion of losing other destinations but keeping their maps. Or in the case of the Dreaming City, that one is sticking around, but it still has a Gambit map that it lost last year. I'm very confused, and the Warden of Nothing strike from the Tangled Shore is also staying, but I guess that one isn't connected to the shore technically, so... Sure, we are losing strikes, something that I never like and something that I don't think a lot of people like. But the strikes that we are losing are not exactly players' favorites either, with health gates and such. Even the vendor on the Tangled Shore will be remedied, giving all of the loot that Spider had to Master Rahul. Making the only reason players went to the Tangled Shore, aside from that lost sector with the DMCA yet banger song, remedied. Seasonal content from this year will be gone, including secret missions again, but I'm not as frustrated as I was losing the other missions, since these secret missions deal with the current plot and those previous ones were short stories tied to the exotic. I'm no longer sitting here worried about my weapons and armor, but I am sitting here excited for new weapons and new armor. New destinations. New, new, new. Beyond Light took the brunt of the biggest wave of sunsetting to push Destiny forward, and although it hurt myself and many longtime players, splitting up a massive amount of a community, it also pushed out the old and catered to a new, at least in the February vision. I will always feel a little empty knowing that content is leaving, but I think from here on out, Bungie has a plan like I have never seen the studio have. It just really sucks that a game and franchise I love so much also gives me trust issues of what I can expect year after year. So please, I ask you Jogoroth and the team at Bungie, don't fumble it with the Witch Queen. When I originally wrote this portion of the video, it was in two parts. The story of Beyond Light, which included narrative shifts in seasonal story for Destiny, the story of Aramis, the darkness, and the characters that played a role. The other section was promises Bungie had made with Beyond Light, the illusion from good marketing, the focus of light versus dark, and the story of Guardians finally embracing the darkness, seven years from vanilla Destiny. So when the story focused on Europa, Aramis, Elsie Bray, also known as the Stranger, and the whole Bray family, I was okay with it. At first. On surface level, the story is fine. Aramis is a bit of a throwaway villain, a captain who took on darkness and leaned into stasis, the cosmic space ice. Beat Aramis's gang who all use stasis in some form and then defeat her, even with an epilogue of fighting another boss after. This is all fine. But where Destiny lost a lot of players was in the notion that the Darkness was going to be this all-powerful player. The season before Beyond Light had pyramids invading planets, activities based around pyramids, storylines propped up from the pyramids. Hell, even the game's defense system or Destiny's version of Cortana in Rasputin was shut down by the pyramids in a cutscene. There was even a crazy final mission in the Season of Arrivals that showed all factions in some way staring at a pyramid ship. The plot of Shadowkeep, the DLC before Beyond Light, was a hidden pyramid ship on the moon. And the seasonal event finale was the darkness shutting down Destiny. So again, it's not that Aramis, the Bray family story, and the Fallen story were bad. It's that everything led into a huge climactic moment. A moment when Bungie went on the record to say that players were going on an adventure to discover the true nature of light and dark. This whole plotline of Beyond Light felt like it was just sort of there to be a filler while Bungie worked on figuring out what the hell they wanted to do with the darkness. Major players like Eris Morn and the Drifter were supposed to be huge role players here featured in cutscenes and promotional material. Hell, I even got sent a Drifter rubber duck. But they maybe had a piece of dialogue or two, and that's it. The year was, as Bungie's Julia Narden says, a year supposed to be focused on how factions react to the disappeared destinations. But with Beyond Light, 
I feel no connection to this story. Yes, there is a pyramid ship, and yes, players got stasis, a darkness ability, but players saw no figure to represent the pyramids, just another hollow shell with another statue. I think a darkness enemy, like the supposed veil that players have been speculating on for years, including me, would have done wonders to the legacy of Beyond Light, because as it stands now, the Beyond Light story leaves a lot to be desired, and follows the most devious of tropes, not fully killing your villain. You see that health bar at the end of Aramis's fight? Yeah, that's fucked up, and you know by freezing yet not killing Aramis in the campaign, Bungie is leaving the window open for her to return, and I just hate this so much. This self-contained story of Europa, which will be forgotten about by a lot of players, still has the necessity to somehow have the villain open-ended. Nah, not for me. The good news, or bad news depending on who you ask, is that the raid had the story tied into it. A very mature, and in my opinion, rightful next step for Destiny. We may not have gotten to see the Deepstone Crypt making exos in the way it's depicted in the lore with dreams, with the towers, really fucking awesome, you should read up about it. But what we did learn is that the darkness goes into making the exos, and that the fallen have somehow taken this place over, bringing Tanix back to life, and one of Aramis's lieutenants, Atrax, turning into an exo raid boss. The raid's amazing, there's the trip to space, a raid video I made, and one of the best soundtracks in video game history here. We will come back to this raid in a little bit, but it's a great time and almost fixes a lot of problems that the DLC had. Almost. Bungie tried to do what they had previously done with Forsaken in Beyond Light as well, dropping content after the raid was beaten, and it sort of worked, but you could just tell it didn't ring the same bells. In Forsaken, the dungeon was the big secret and leveling was ridiculously hard so any extra content after the raid was beaten was a huge bonus. Plus, Forsaken had the luxury of being the first DLC to do this. Beyond Light, copying the same formula but offering less in its wake, just muddied the intention I think Bungie was aiming for. The only hope I have after a great conclusion with Clovis Bray and The Stranger is that Europa doesn't get forgotten about the way that some other destinations in Destiny have. I hope there's a reason to return to this icy moon that doesn't just mean bounty farming. There is still a lot left on the table with this place, so it would be a shame for that to happen. I hope the same formula of raids being tied to the story is also apparent in The Witch Queen. The struggle with this major launch of an expansion tied together with Bungie's seasonal story is that they tend to be telling completely separate stories at the same time. You have this 6-8 to eight hour journey to discover Europa and the Bray family with the Fallen, while also having a separate story with Aldrin Sav, now known as the Crow and Osiris. There is zero, and I mean zero, tie-in to Europa, and I can only hope that the Witch Queen will have a tie-in for the seasonal content with the major DLC story. I will say that the winner for story in all of Destiny's year has been the Year Beyond Light. There was a shift narratively with Beyond Light like no other, with weekly and episodic reasons to jump on Destiny to see where the story was going next. Trust being broken, Savathun approaching and being with us the whole time, allying with the Cabal and allying with the Fallen. I mean, this is huge turning points I thought we would never see in Destiny unless it was on a lore card. But the story came front and center this year. I really hope Bungie can stick to this story beat and deliver it even better with the Witch Queen, because that really is the highest point of the entire year for Destiny, and a point that I don't really think anybody's arguing against. There is still a lot to tell, and trust is about all you can do if you're a Destiny player, but the story of the future looks to be in good hands for longtime players. However, 
for new players and long returning players, they need way more than a fucking timeline that has a sentence of each story that happened. I really hope to see cutscenes to refresh or educate new and returning players who want to know what's going on, or else it will feel like new players have been forgotten about and returning players sunset. This is where I transition. New Light. What a shit show this was, and still is. Alright, look, it's no secret that Destiny is an expensive game, but it's also a convolutedly priced game too. New Lights used to have access to the Red War campaign, Curse of Osiris campaign, and the Warmind campaign along with three raids and a dungeon, plenty of destinations, PvP, even Trials of Osiris. That's a lot of bang for your buck, and the complaint from longtime players had been that the Season Pass model introduced in Shadowkeep, the price of emotes, ornaments, etc. in Eververse fit a free-to-play model, so much so that paying for the game didn't have enough reason all the time. If you love Destiny, or you even like Destiny, New Light doesn't really apply to you. You probably own a lot of expansions, or all of them. But for New Lights, who came in with Beyond Light, a promised, more refined experience with the Cosmodrome and Aztec, I mean Shah Han, was the right next step. A story that would introduce the world of Destiny and get players familiar with how the game works, right? This didn't really apply at all. It actually got more confusing and way worse. I'll start with the positive. Trials of Osiris not being free to play was a great thing. Losing all of those raids and destinations, a full three campaigns, etc. in exchange for a very shallow few missions that you still don't know what's going on? That one's tough. On top of that, it's not clear for New Lights what is actually free to play and what isn't. With seasonal activities in free to play areas blocking off New Lights from certain free places. New Lights and Shadowkeep got to experience hundreds of hours of gameplay. It introduced the world in a sequential order of operations. With Beyond Light's New Light experience, you are given one area to then jump into literally any remaining story without so much as a cutscene to catch you up. In Shadowkeep, I would call Destiny 2 a free-to-play game. In Beyond Light, I would call Destiny 2 a confusing-to-play game, with free-to-play season pass models still existing. Eververse acting like Destiny is free to play in regards to its pricing, and now this egregious transmog system that is confusing on purpose. I really hope that New Light is fixed and expanded upon in the Witch Queen, or just removed altogether, since with sunsetting it feels like we will never be back to a place where New Light is worth players' time anymore. I will say that Trials and Free to Play got so bad with cheaters that Bungie's hand was forced on getting an anti-cheat, which is great, I absolutely love that. Unfortunately, as of writing this video, there's even a Save the New Lights initiative going on, where new lights are being thrown into Dares of Eternity, Bungie's new free-to-play activity, at a way lower level than the activity requires. So now people are lowering their light level to jump in and help out. Ah, <sighs> what a shit show. I know it can feel like I'm only shitting on Bungie, and I don't want you to take a section of this video and feel only that tone with it. Destiny is a nuanced and divided game. While one side may flourish, another side will be punished for that. But one thing that hurts every single player, in the case of New Light and pricing, is trust. And that, I hope Bungie is aiming to earn back. It has been a year since Beyond Light's release, and one of the biggest selling points of the entire year was a Darkness subclass, a super about freezing your opponent in various ways, a potential game-changing subclass that was set to be so impactful that Bungie promoted dynamic weather with it. Let me start by saying that the sound design for Stasis, Europa, the entire year of Destiny, deserves an award every year, and this year probably more than any. Seeing as how everything was recorded from home and Bungie's team had to get creative with it, my god, I can only hope there is something as ear-porny, is that even a word? 
I hope there is something as ear porny as these sounds. Never have I ever wanted to pop a super more than the Stasis Warlock, and never have I ever wanted to listen to Ice Shatter more than in Beyond Light. Bungie could have made these supers very generic sounding and generic looking in presentation, but no, that's the appeal of Destiny supers above all other games. The look of a revenant hunter spinning with the fierce throw of an ice pickaxe, the enemies disintegrating into crystals, the dynamic weather around. That's what Bungie puts their foot on, and it's why you don't see games like Outriders giving you the same level of enjoyment from using an ability. I say all of this to also say that just as much good as Stasis has created, it created equal, if not mostly bad for a long time. Let's start with the dynamic weather and the Storm of Europa. This part of the cell for Beyond Light felt very gimmicky and markety, owing to an upgraded engine with some new features. I was hoping for something more than a little push on my sparrow and some fog. I wanted that, quote, every piece of the environment changing, feel with the storm, but that wasn't delivered. I can only hope that this dynamic weather approach leads into the Witch Queen and is expanded upon further because it's not that it's a bad idea, it's that it left a lot on the table for more. Speaking of which, let's talk about the biggest villain of the year, bigger than Aramis, bigger than the pyramid ships, bigger than me when I ask you to subscribe. Do that by the way. Let's talk about Stasis. Stasis launched in the most bafflingly broken manner. One hit kill super abilities that lasted forever. Abilities that were supers that could freeze someone for a whole five seconds and almost kill them if they escaped. A plethora of problems for balancing right after things started to seem like they were trending upwards in PvP. The word Shatter Dive still gives Destiny players PTSD and it didn't help that Kevin Giannis, a sandbox lead at Bungie, said that quote, when we shipped it, the consensus was, yep, we're gonna have to nerf that. I want to say Stasis has been nerfed a solid five to six times for the entirety of its lifetime, and its problems became the talk of the town for the whole year. I raised the question then with Beyond Light, Stasis, and a topic we'll get to right after this. Should it have been delayed more? I think so. After three months of delay to still ship Stasis in its original state, with no free-to-play player in mind, just told me that Bungie wanted something that you had to have or you were going to be punished for not having it. Basically bullying the player into purchasing these overpowered supers. As the year went on and balancing patches were made, I am happy to say that right now, Stasis is in a very good place. It's a strong pick in PvE with a lot of build variety, and it changes the way you can approach gunfights. While in PvP, it's now a zoning class that allows players to cut off and create new spaces like never before. This is what every Destiny player envisioned Stasis to be when it first launched. In The Witch Queen, Bungie is aiming to have a Void rework, followed by an Arc and Solar rework sometime after. And I'm all for this. In the February update, Bungie laid out a sandbox team in place that will carry season to season instead of swapping roles like before. So I'm confident that this team will learn and overcome the obstacles together, instead of passing a torch to another to start all over. You can feel that the sandbox team at Bungie is better than ever, constantly updating overtuned exotics before they become a seasonal problem, buffing underutilized exotics and classes, constantly getting weapons that haven't seen the daylight involved. The exotics from Beyond Light are some of the most creative and awesome exotics I have ever seen Bungie make, and I can't believe I'm sitting here seven years after the first Destiny launch saying, damn, this new exotic is tremendous and original. Bravo to whoever made the lament, by the way, this one has easily been my favorite all year. Beyond Light was steering the ship clean into an iceberg before, but with the February shift, the iceberg seems to be doing little to no damage to this side of the game. The sandbox team at Bungie since Beyond Light's launch has done nothing but work to make Destiny better than it has ever felt. But it just sucks that it took a sucker punch to the face before the fixes came in. I'm going to keep this section short and sweet, and I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. I'm going to start from today's Beyond Light and work backwards. 
Nowadays, the Deep Stone Crypt is an easy but very fun raid with some solid foundation built into it. Back when this raid first launched, it was so unfinished that you could accidentally walk into a wall and end up out of the map. Nowadays, Deep Stone Crypt has some threat to it. Back then, this raid didn't even have snipers where it does now. Nowadays, Deep Stone Crypt has enemies that shoot at you. Back then, Deep Stone Crypt had enemies that didn't even know you existed. Bugs that could crash your whole game, or solo a raid boss if you were patient enough. Unfinished textures which led players to getting into the raid early, partially ruining the integrity of a world's first race, or throwing a grenade at a vandal in a box that counted as a security fuse. No, I'm not joking, this is real. Deep Stone Crypt and all of Europa, hell, all of the game, have had a lot of updates to patch bugs in them. Bungie upgraded their engine to fix bugs quicker, update content quicker, etc., but left a lot of bugs and created even more. It was a lot of work, I'm sure. But now, a lot of content gets updated. The one issue that's still not fixed is constant frame rate bugs, with menus and locations causing even the best PCs out there to lose hundreds of frames seemingly at random. PC players also had an issue that nobody seems to talk about, where you had to delete your whole friends list to get on the game because having more than 25 friends online who played Destiny caused the game to crash. This isn't a solo game, it's a social one, so having this problem really fucking sucked. But Bungie stuck to their promise of fixing issues. Let's just hope that the framerate one gets fixed too. Going back to DSC, almost all of the out of bounds and glitch spots have been fixed, and the raid has gotten harder, making me wonder if this DLC was even close to finished when it launched. The short answer is no. No, it was not. If there is a silver lining in this, it's that Bungie has aimed the game for Witch Queen to be a completed experience, with a much longer delay than Beyond Light had, and now they're used to working from home. I talked to a friend of mine who works in a similar field to Bungie developers, and he told me that when COVID hit, it wasn't that the work was any harder, it's that his company had not been prepared to work from home, so most of the delays were to shift the workspace to a home environment quickly, and I can only imagine that this is where most of the work Bungie faced with Beyond Light went. So if Bungie is used to this, and they're waiting on a new studio, the delay can't be from the shift to the Rona schedules. The delay has to be to deliver the content. Beyond Light in its one year has been the worst and best Destiny has ever been. And I think it's a great case to study video games and their communities in this era. A game that had to meet a deadline under all scrutiny and pressure when it clearly wasn't finished. An ambitious restart instead of a disappointing sequel. A lesson for Bungie to learn from and deliver a stronger DLC in The Witch Queen. And a community that is very, very confused at the moment. I do believe Beyond Light has been the best year Destiny has been in terms of story in terms of predictable content with weapons, exotics, activities that I find pretty repetitive and boring, but at least they're consistent, the health of the game, etc. But I also believe Beyond Light has been the worst year for Destiny in terms of an at-launch product. In the one year since its launch, the game and the community has had to sit and trust that Bungie would deliver content that makes the best-in-class pew-pew side of the game surround itself in the best-in-class everything else side of the game. I can happily say now that for any reason, if you want to pick up and try Destiny, there are reasons for it. It may take some time. It may take having to watch a few videos to understand this or that. But the game looks to be shooting itself into another golden era. One that I can only trust Bungie will deliver in 2022 and so on. And this is why I believe Beyond Light in the one year that it has existed, has split the Destiny community in half. Thank you for watching. There won't be any bloopers on this one since it's been so long, and what kind of bloopers could I even put here? Thanks to my patrons for the support, as well as everyone who watches these videos and supports me on Twitch and here on YouTube. It's been a journey, and this year I want you to trust that I'll be an even better creator than ever. So until the next video or live stream, have a nice day.
Hmm.